There's a strange rule implemented in my hometown during the first snow. All residents are mandated to bunker down on the lowest floor of their home and to cover every window with opaque fabric. I'd almost forgotten about this rule. I've lived out of state for three years and this is my first Christmas being home. I was standing at the window when the first crystalline flakes fell. They looked beautiful, glinting hues of orange and yellow with the setting sun. I could have stood at that window all day, watching those winter fireflies dazzle and gleam. But my mother jerked me away. Are you crazy? Mom demanded as she pulled the curtains closed. Beside her, my father was taping cardboard to block the narrow opening of the stained glass above the front door. Before I could respond, the flood alarms sounded. It's not a devastating screech like a police siren or a fire alarm. It's a low, far-reaching bellow that spreads across the land. A shiver ran up my spine. Through the tan fabric of the curtains, I saw the streetlights abandon their flickering yellow hues in favor of that all-encompassing red. Dad had been watching the sports channel, but that was replaced by static and a long, drawn-out beep. This is an emergency services message. This is not a warning. I repeat, not a warning. My sister, Rebecca, had her own baby now, but she looked the same as when we were children, pressed against the television with tears streaming from her eyes. She held her baby close to her chest, mumbling something under her breath. Maybe a prayer? The broadcast continued. The giant is awake and currently moving through Lower Morgan Street. All residents are advised to retreat to their basements if they have not done so. As a kid, I always assumed this was some elaborate prank, the grown-ups trying to scare us into being good or else the giant would eat us. However, witnessing this as an adult and recognizing the fear in my parents' eyes, I felt more unnerved than I ever had as a child. Okay, Dad declared, that's the last of it. Everybody to the bathroom. Hurry. My childhood home lacked a basement, so every year we would pile into the bathroom on the ground level. It's the innermost room with no windows to the outside. It was significantly easier to do this when we were children. Mom would lay with us in the tub. Rebecca and I curled against either side of her while Dad stood at the door, ready. Now Becca was the only one in the tub, holding her daughter tightly and crying silent tears as she looked towards the door. Mom sat upon the closed toilet lid while my father and I were sandwiched between the door and the sink. He was breathing hard. Too hard. Dad? I asked. Are you okay? He opened his mouth as if to speak, but only a rasp came out. He clutched at his chest. His inhaler? Where was it? I'll be right back, I told them. I need to get Dad's inhaler. As soon as I stepped out, I saw an eye through a small slit in the living room curtain. It was an unnatural shade of purple, the iris flecked with black dots and the pupil resembling that of a goat. There was a devastating roar that shook the window pane. A pink hand lined with dirtied white fur crashed through the window, and my world went black. I woke up hours later beneath the rubble of my childhood home, utterly alone. As far as side hustles go, many people wouldn't expect owning a metal detector to be profitable. And yeah, there's a learning curve to detector life. For example, I used to be a beach guy. White sand, silver coins, and gold necklaces. Well, that was the fantasy. In reality, I'd come home from a long day of grinding, only to have a sunburn, a pocket full of loose change, and a trash bag of beer cans to sell to the recycling plant. That's when I decided to try a different location. There's a popular ski resort north of my town. It attracts upper-end clientele during the winter months, and after getting sick of breathing the salty cold air wafting off the ocean, I decided to give the resort a shot. That first day had me kissing the beach goodbye. I found an earring, a diamond earring, and an iPhone. 
Of course, every day wasn't quite that profitable, but it sure beats digging through coarse sand only to find a crushed up can of Bud Light. It's been a great way to make extra money, and I haven't had any complaints until yesterday. I was working under the ski lift. You'd be surprised how many inattentive vacationers drop their phones, bracelets, or even wallets as they make the slow, anticipation-filled rise to the top of the tallest slope, Death Mountain. Maybe it's the anxious feeling of jumping off the lift to go zooming down the resort's curviest, most dangerous slope that leaves people so susceptible to losing their items. Or maybe they're just so well off that they don't care about losing possessions that would take me months to pay off. Either way, the result is always a wealthier me. The day was going well. I'd started the morning off by finding an expensive-looking pocket knife buried deep in the snow. A short distance from that, my detector beeped once more. I plunged my gloved hand into the snow and began feeling around. There was nothing obvious at first, but I heard a human gurgle. I uncovered a blue-tinted nose sticking out of the snow. My mind raced. Had someone fallen off the ski lift? How long had they been lying here to become buried beneath the snow? I threw my metal detector aside and began frantically digging. The snow soaked through my gloves. My hands felt like ice. Slowly, I uncovered the body of a young woman. I tried to pull her out of the snow, but her hair and clothing crackled like ice. She was frozen in the ground. Despite this, she was still alive. Breath steamed from her nostrils in shallow, unsteady spurts. With great effort, she opened her mouth. The thin layer of skin on her lower lip tore to stick to her upper lip, yet no blood spilled from the wound. Tim, she rasped. Tim Bransom did this. Her eyes didn't close, but her shallow breath was no more. I stumbled backward, suddenly feeling as if I was going to throw up. I wrestled my phone out of my coat and immediately dialed 911. When authorities finally ascended the mountain, the first cop didn't even try speaking with me. He immediately tackled me to the ground and frisked my pockets, removing the knife. A man wearing a hat reading Forensic quickly bagged it, saying, Good catch, Officer Bransom. Now, I'm sitting in a prison cell, charged with murder, and will most likely be convicted due to my possession of the murder weapon and egregious claim that the responding officer is the actual culprit. They say spring is for lovers, but I disagree. Just look around your city this winter. You'll find a myriad of couples, old and young, huddled together, walking hand in hand. They'll stop beneath the mistletoe, skate along the ice, and keep each other's hearts aflame, despite the freezing temperature. The cold nights spent alone make you realize just how empty you are. I saw a young couple outside my apartment complex building a snowman, and that's when an idea struck. I've never had much luck with love, even in my prime. My youth has faded and my opportunity to find the fabled one seems entirely unrealistic. Yet the sight of that couple awakened an urge I thought was dead. That deep desire to find a connection capable of thawing my frozen heart. Dating never suited me, but perhaps there's another way. After all, how did one of the oldest love stories begin? Adam and Eve? She was made for him. So I decided to follow in the footsteps of my ancestor, to create a woman as that couple had from Snow. If everyone else has someone, why do I not deserve the same love? I bundled up in my thickest coat and turned off the heat from my unit. After that, I dumped bucket after bucket of snow into my living room. When I finally felt I had enough, the work began. True love and long-lasting relationships always require a significant amount of elbow grease. I wasn't going to shy away when I felt so close to finally having what my heart desired. Over the course of a week, I shaped her body into perfect proportions and gave her features as regal as any queen. 
From the dip of her collarbones to the thin veins of her ankles, I sculpted a flawless woman. When she was finally complete, I marveled at my work, admiring every subtle curve. But then I realized something was missing. The chilly air. The woman was no longer mere snow. She must have been so cold. Hold on, dear, I told her. Let me get you something to wear. I rummaged through my closet trying to find something acceptable for her, but everything was too drab. It would have taken away from her splendor. I'll be back, I said as I carefully draped a blanket around her shoulders. I'll need to buy you something new. Something as beautiful as you, my love. And with that, I rushed out. It took quite a while to find something, but eventually I decided on an icy blue evening gown with a pair of sapphire earrings to match. When I got home, my heart plummeted. It rested upon my guts, heavy and cold as if freezing me from the inside. My love was not where I had left her. Instead, there was a puddle of water. No, I cried, dropping the gown. My love, an icy touch gripped my shoulder. Why are you crying, darling? As soon as I heard that high feminine voice, I knew it was her. I turned and saw her standing behind me, my love. She was as beautiful as when I had left her. Chill water dripped from her palm to run down my arm. She stooped to collect the dress I'd gotten her. Oh, she smiled. It's beautiful, but I fear I need more than this. I noticed the scalpel in her hand for the first time. I need real skin to keep me warm. At first I thought I'd resist, but... Did Adam not give up a rib for his Eve? 